Hello everyone, welcome back to part 3 of the tutorial series. I really appreciate the support we've gone so far on the previous videos, and today I'll be showing you how to do constraints. So here's the aura we made last time. As you can see here, the aura is mostly complete, but some people might be saying that it's missing something. And that's maybe a spinning object, let's say. But how do we do that? So, we're gonna do that with something called constraints. To introduce us a little bit into what constraints are, we'll just go back to the part that I used for the aura last time. This is the part that emits the particles coming from the ground, and one thing that I didn't do last time is that I didn't actually touch its properties, I just made it into a cylinder. So if we run this right here, we'll see there's immediately a problem. You can see that the part is popping out of the ground as soon as we spawn in, which is because we did not change the can collide properties. Along with turning off can collide, we're also going to keep anchored off and then turn on massless. This is going to keep the part from dragging the player using its weight. In theory, the properties should be set, right? But as soon as we spawn in, there's another problem. The part falls out of the world. We can't just turn on anchored because that's going to keep our player from moving when it's going to be on our player. But what else can we do to keep the part moving with our player? Well, that's called a well constraint. What this will allow us to do is to put two parts together regardless of whether they're anchored or not. In this case, that'll be the humanoid root part and the part that makes the particles. Now, as soon as we click run, we're gonna see the part stays in place. And now, if I just add it to the properties of the part really quickly, you're gonna see that it's not anchored, but it's not moving, because our humanoid root part is anchored. Now that I've shown what a weld constraint is, we can move on to something a little bit more difficult, but also a little more useful. The next thing I'm going to be showing is something that is going to involve rotating objects around your character. So to show you a basic demonstration, I'm just going to go away from the humanoid for a second and create a new contraption. So we're going to add a new part, and we're going to use these settings. So first of all, I'm going to scale it to one by one. Then I'm just going to go ahead and rename it to something called Anchor. This doesn't really matter, but I like to name things accordingly, so... We're just going to go ahead and disable Can Collide, enable Anchored for now, and then enable Massless as well. An extra thing we're going to go ahead and do here is enable Custom Physical Properties and change all of them to zero or as low as you can. Now we're just going to end up with this little floating block if we just click Run. The next part we're going to add is going to be a part that's basically the same except we're going to scale it to a little bit more and then we're going to go ahead and change Anchored back to False. We are also going to rename this as well. We're going to make this Spinning because it's going to be the part that spins around the anchor. Now, for the next step of the process, I'm just going to separate them temporarily. And we're going to go into Model and Cylindrical Constraints. We are going to go ahead and add one on top of that one and on top of that one. When you do this, make sure that when you put them back together, that the two attachments are on top of each other. Now, to actually let this spin, we are going to go ahead and change the properties of the cylindrical constraint. First of all, we're going to change the angular actuator type to motor, and we're going to go ahead and set the angular velocity to whatever we want to be the speed. In this case, I'm going to put 1. Now, we're going to go ahead and scroll all the way to the bottom, and click Limits Enabled. Make sure it's the correct Limits Enabled, because there's two different kinds of Limits Enabled. And we're going to change the upper limit to 0 
The final step is just going to be to change the max torque all the way to a really high number or even infinite. The last two things we just did are going to prevent a lot of bugs that can happen with these constraints. Finally, I'm just going to unanchor the spinner, and then if we click run, we're going to have a working spinner. Now you might be thinking, well, this is cool, it's a spinner, it spins, but how do we make things orbit around the spinner? And for that, we're going to go back to the weld constraint. First of all, we're going to go ahead and duplicate this part. Then we will just move the part outwards away from the spinner. To make these easier to tell apart, I'm just going to scale this one to a 1x1 one one and color it black. Before we weld them together, I'm just going to rename this to spinning block. And now it's actually time to weld the two together. So we're going to go ahead and go to either this menu which we used before, or we can go to the same drop down that we used the cylindrical constraint from. Now that both of them are welded, we're going to go ahead and click run, and we'll have a working spinning object. Now you've finally done your first spinner prototype. But how do we put this onto our rig? So to do that, first of all, we're going to go ahead and group this into a model. You don't have to do this, but it does make it more organized. Then we're just going to go ahead and drag it into humanoid root part. The next step is going to be to center this in the middle of your humanoid root part, unless you want your spinner to be off center. And for the last step, we're going to go ahead and take the anchor and weld it over to our humanoid root part. Now that we've done that, if we click run, the spinner will now be working and welded to our character. One thing I forgot to mention is that you have to also unanchor the anchor part. If we don't, then our character won't be able to move. One thing you can do to make this look cooler is that you can tilt the spinner. Once you do that, you can actually remake the part that I just deleted. I'm just going to rename it to what it was before. And I'm going to go ahead and re-weld it over to our spinner. Now that you've done this, your tilted spinner should be working just fine. As you can see, this looks really cool. Now that we've assembled our spinner, I can go ahead and start putting particles on this thing by first of all making these parts invisible, then actually going to design the particle. I sped this up times 10, so you don't really see the entire process of me just adjusting one color over and over. Finally, I'm gonna end up with this as my particle trail. To make a trail like this, we're gonna use a particle that slowly scales down in size using a number sequence which if you don't know what that is, you can go ahead and check out my part 1 video, and making sure that lock to part is disabled. Finally, I'm just going to copy over this particle to the other side, so I have a mirror copy of it. Now if I just click run, we're going to see a very beautiful particle trail.
This is pretty much it for the first two kinds of constraints, so now I'm going to go ahead and show something that might serve a lot of use to a lot of you. What I'm going to show next is linked in the description, and I'm going to give credit to the server that it's from. So this is an entire constraint pack filled with spinners and things of every kind that you can use for auras. You can look through these to learn how these work, or you can even just attach them to the aura without really doing much. The ones that I find the most useful are probably the ones over at the top panel, where the green, blue, and red spinners are. As you can see here, the three colors represent the level of difficulty of the spinner, And although I've shown basically the two constraints that you're going to be using the most when making an aura, there is still one left that I'll be showing, which is called a prismatic constraint. There is one spinner in this pack that's pretty simple to understand that I can use to show what a prismatic constraint is. That's going to be this top left red spinner here. All I'm going to do is I'm just going to make a copy of it so I can show it to you here. So essentially what this spinner does is that this red part is going to be where the particle is going to be and these other parts are going to allow it to follow a certain trajectory. What I'm selecting here is the prismatic constraint that's going to connect the red part to something that I'll explain in just a second. If you look carefully here, you're going to see that the red part is not anchored. So first of all, the goal of this black part, the one at the top, is to make the red part follow it. This is going to be done using something called an align position. So as you can see here, they're both connected through a little line over there in the middle. And as the black part moves around, the red part will follow it in height. But the reason it's not going to follow its entire position is actually because of the second black part, the one that has the prismatic constraint. That's because this black part limits the red part to move only on the axis that the black part creates with the red part. What I mean by that is that it's going to go ahead and move only on the line created between the two parts. And as this spinner rotates the black part, the red part tries to match its position, in turn, going up and down. To those who didn't really understand this too well, I'm now going to go ahead and recreate this spinner from scratch to show you how it all works. We're going to start this out in a way very similar to our previous spinner, and that's by creating an anchor part and then a spinner. For this showcase, since I'm not going to attach it to a character, we don't need to check custom physical properties. This time, I'm going to scale the spinner part a little bit differently, so that it's standing vertically and it's pretty long. Finally, I'll just change the color to help us see the difference better. The next thing we're going to do is the same as in the other spinner, and that's actually adding the cylindrical constraint. You don't have to keep the parts together like I did here, you can actually just move them apart and then move them back together, but I decided to be stubborn and do it while they're in the same spot. Now, we will just match the same settings as we had before for the spinner, except maybe this time I'll pick a different speed or direction. Now once we're done setting up this spinner, we can go ahead and move on to the next step. First I'm just going to show that it still works.
Then we're just gonna take that spinner part and clone it. We're gonna go ahead and scale it so it can be on the edge of the previous spinner part. I'll recolor this as well and delete all the stuff that was under it before. Lastly, I'm just gonna weld it over to that spinner part. After renaming it, we can continue with all the other stuff, which is going to be the stuff that you haven't seen before. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to make the other part, the one that's actually going to hold the particle and going to be moving. I will just rename this the following because it's following the black part. And the next thing we have to do is add the align position. To add it, you can add it the same way as any other constraint, and you can simply just pick out the attachments. Now, we're just going to add the final part that makes this entire thing work. For that, I'm just going to clone that black part and move it over down here. Make sure that it's parallel with the spinner. And now the final step we have is to add the prismatic constraint. Once you've added it like so, our contraption is ready to go. All we have left to do is to click run and see what we've made. Unfortunately here I made a mistake by forgetting to change the weld. What I was actually supposed to weld was the black part over to the anchor and not the spinner. I think that this just shows no matter how much you know about these things, you might still mess up, so don't worry too much if you make a mistake. Finally, we end up with this. To make an aura, this is basically what you need. You don't really need all those complicated spinners or those different constraints to make stuff like this. However, there is a possibility that I'll make a sequel to this video and show more constraints. And just as a reminder, this is what we ended up making at the end of our session. Once again, thank you so much for watching my videos, because at the start of all of this, I didn't even think I was gonna blow up. I had a dead channel for years, and I didn't think that was gonna change. Thank you so much again, and I'll see you next time.